The year is 1865. The United States of America have been divided for four years in a bloody civil war. What began as a sectional conflict over the future of slavery in the western territories had spiraled into a secession crisis wherein 11 southern states broke away to form a confederacy that guaranteed the rights of slaveholders. When Confederates attempted to seize the federal garrison at Fort Sumter, South Carolina in 1861, President Abraham Lincoln led the remaining northern states of the Union into a war to restore the United States. Since then, the continent had been plunged into unprecedented violence and bloodshed. After a few failed attempts by the Union to strike at the Confederate capital in Virginia, and the failure of Confederate General Robert E. Lee to invade the North, the two sides had settled into a long war of attrition. In an effort to further weaken the Confederacy, solve difficult legal problems with slaves escaping to Union lines, and to enhance the moral mission of the Union armies, Abraham Lincoln issued his famous Emancipation Proclamation at the start of 1863. While it would not free thousands of slaves in Union-held territory, it declared all slaves in currently rebelling territory to be free meaning that Union advances would now bring the destruction of the Southern slaveholding society and liberation for millions of black Americans. The Confederacy had been on a downward trajectory since the end of 1862. Trade was strangled by the Union blockade and the North's control of the Mississippi River following the capture of New Orleans and Vicksburg split the young nation down the middle. The South struggled with a population that was less than half that of the North. Additionally, about 40% of the South's population was enslaved and were not willing participants in the war. The South also lacked heavy industry and railroad connections that the North possessed in great supply. When Lincoln appointed Ulysses S. Grant to command all Union forces in early 1864, he had found a man who, though lacking some of the tactical skills of Robert E. Lee, knew how to win the war. Grant used his superior numbers to pin Lee's Army of Northern Virginia down in a number of bloody stalemates, draining the south of its manpower. Meanwhile, General William Tecumseh Sherman invaded the south through the back door, burning Atlanta, Savannah, and many other southern cities on his march to the sea. While Grant destroyed the South's manpower, Sherman was destroying its infrastructure. By the spring of 1865, the situation had become totally hopeless for the Confederacy. No foreign allies would assist them, and the Union under Lincoln's leadership had not lost the will to fight. Thus, with the South in ruins and the Union on the cusp of victory, we arrive at the wildest month in American history, the April of 1865. Grant had pinned down Lee's Army of Northern Virginia for nine months in the Siege of Richmond and Petersburg, a town just south of the Confederate capital. Bloodied, outnumbered, and running low on supplies, Lee determined that the capital must be abandoned, giving short notice to the Confederate President, Jefferson Davis, who believed in fighting to the very end. The South's only faint hope lay in the Army of Northern Virginia combining with the Army of Tennessee, which was stationed in North Carolina under General Joseph E. Johnson. Lee attempted to break out of Grant's siege lines, but was caught by Union cavalry under the command of Philip Sheridan on the morning of April 9th. The jig was finally up, and Lee knew it. Using an off-white dish towel, Lee's army offered a truce, which was received by General George Armstrong Custer, who would later famously die at the Little Bighorn. Grant allowed Lee to select the site of surrender, and the two met at the mansion of Wilmer McLean in the small town of Appomattox Courthouse. Lee wore his full-dress uniform in impeccable condition. While Grant strolled in wearing a battered, generic soldier's uniform covered in mud. The two awkwardly discussed their time together back in the Mexican-American War before Lee reminded Grant of the occasion, whereupon Grant offered the terms of surrender. The Confederates would lay down their arms and return home to their families, promising only never to take up arms against the Union again. Officers could keep their sidearms and baggage, and the men were permitted to keep their horses and mules to assist in restarting their farms. 
The terms were extremely generous, especially considering the amount of men on both sides in prison camps and the Union men clamoring to hang leading Confederates as traitors. The terms were written up by Eli Parker, a member of the Seneca tribe of Native Americans. Lee signed his copy on a marble-topped table while Grant used a simple wood one. The surrender ceremony was conducted by Brigadier General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a hero of Gettysburg, who reportedly had his men salute the Confederates as they marched onward. While Appomattox marks only the surrender of Lee's army, not the entire Confederacy, it sounded the death knell of the Southern cause. Jefferson Davis and his cabinet were forced to flee, still fearing capture and execution. The remaining Confederate armies in the field, already experiencing low morale, began surrendering en masse upon hearing the news that their greatest military leader had thrown in the towel. The single largest surrender came with General Johnston's surrender of the 90,000-strong Army of Tennessee on April 26th to General Sherman. Though a few holdouts and guerrillas would hold on in the West, the war was over. The war's conclusion meant liberty for literally millions. Though the 13th Amendment would not end slavery nationally until its ratification at the end of the year, the bulk of slaves were freed under the Emancipation Proclamation as Union forces took control of Confederate land, much of which was achieved in April of 1865. In addition to the nearly 3 million slaves finding their freedom, the chains of tens of thousands of prisoners of war were also being broken. When prisoner of war exchanges between the North and South were suspended in 1863 owing to Confederate refusal to exchange black soldiers for white, and then ended in 1864 in Grant's effort to starve the Confederacy of men, both sides were forced to construct massive prisons to house captured soldiers. The largest Confederate prison was at Andersonville, Georgia, and was built to house 30,000 men, though in total it housed 45,000. The prison was little more than 26 acres of muddy ground fenced in by wooden stakes. The prisoners received minimal food, clothing, and shelter. Though after the war the prison superintendent, Henry Wurz, would be blamed for conditions, the Confederacy could hardly feed its own soldiers. Thus, the Union prisoners were left to starve and die of uncontrolled disease. Over 25% of all prisoners in Andersonville died. More prisoners died in Andersonville during about a year of operation than died on both sides of the Battle of Gettysburg. But in April of 1865, the collapsing Confederacy announced the transfer of all prisoners without exchange, meaning the Union prisoners would be transported to Union lines and then back home. Freedom was indeed in the air. But all was not so happy. Abraham Lincoln had spent almost every hour of his presidency at war. Finally, with Lee's surrender, Lincoln could begin to relax. Accordingly, he went to his favorite place, the theater. On April 14th, Lincoln had said he felt the happiest he'd felt in a long time. He was going with his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and two guests to a showing of Our American Cousin, a popular comedy. Unfortunately, John Wilkes Booth, a famed Maryland stage actor, had other plans. Booth was an ardent supporter of the Confederacy and hated Lincoln. He was a member of a ring of Confederate spies and sympathizers who had originally planned to kidnap or kill Lincoln in other aborted attempts. But that night was the night for the big plan. Booth was going to assassinate Lincoln and, he hoped, possibly General Grant while two other assassins would kill the Vice President and Secretary of State. This coup would decapitate the government and might be the only thing to save the Southern cause now that Lee had surrendered. During the play's intermission, Lincoln's assigned bodyguard left his post for a drink, and Booth arrived unopposed. Sneaking behind Lincoln and his companions, Booth fired one shot from a pistol into the back of Lincoln's head point-blank range. It did not kill him immediately, but it dealt a mortal blow. Booth had also brought a knife in case something went wrong, though it proved unnecessary. The deed done, Booth leapt from the president's box onto the stage, breaking his leg 
and shouting something to the effect of Sic Semper Tyrannus, I have done it. The Latin meaning thus always to tyrants, and also the motto of Virginia. Before the confusion ceased, Booth made his escape and was on the run, or on the limp. Though Booth had succeeded temporarily, his colleagues had either chickened out, or in the case of Secretary of State Seward's assassin, simply failed. The South was doomed, and so was Booth. Lincoln died in a bed across the street on the morning of April 15th, surrounded by friends. Upon his death, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, famously declared, Now he belongs to the ages. With Lincoln's death and the procession of his funeral train across the North came profound national mourning and a commitment to finish what he started. Newspapers were also obsessed with the manhunt for Booth, and $100,000 were offered for his arrest, an enormous sum. Soldiers had orders to capture Booth alive and eventually tracked him and some of his conspirators down in northern Virginia. When soldiers surrounded him, he sheltered in the barn of the Garrett family farm. As soldiers set fire to the barn, Booth was preparing himself to bolt out in a last stand when Sergeant Boston Corbett disobeyed orders and shot him in the neck. Booth finally died, disabled and resting his head in the lap of a Union officer, on April 26th, the same day the bulk of the Confederate Army surrendered in North Carolina. But the April of 1865 had one more horrible shock in store. Telegraphic communications had been cut off in the South by General Grant, and so Union forces in occupied territory all the way down the Mississippi did not learn of Lincoln's death until a few days afterward. The boat that informed them was the steamboat Sultana, whose captain James Cass Mason carried the news with him after decking his boat in black cloth. Upon delivering this message of death all the way down the Mississippi to occupied New Orleans, Mason and the Sultana sailed back up the river to the port of Vicksburg, Mississippi. There, Mason planned to collect a large load of free Union prisoners from Andersonville. The government was paying top dollar for transportation, and Mason had bribed and cajoled his way into getting a large batch. When the Sultana left Vicksburg, She was carrying just under 2,000 prisoners and nearly 2,150 people in total. Though she was only 260 feet long, the Sultana carried only 100 fewer people than the Titanic on her fateful voyage. The men were forced to cover every square foot, even covering the roof. The Sultana left the port of Memphis on the night of April 26th, the same day Booth was dying and Johnston was surrendering, and headed up the dark river that was flooded with icy water from a heavy season of snowmelt. Around 2 a.m. on the morning of April 27th, three of the Sultana's four boilers exploded. In the ensuing disaster and fire, about 1,200 people lost their lives in the frigid current of the Mississippi. It was the worst maritime disaster in American history, and it happened to men who had just spent months in the world's worst prison following the nation's worst war, just as they were on their way to be reunited with loved ones they'd not seen in years. By the time May 1st rolled around, Americans were grateful for an end to the war, but they were even more grateful that the April of 1865 was finally over. If you'd like to hear the full story on the Sultana disaster, as well as the journey of the people involved, tune into The Inglenook, a podcast about some of history's greatest stories, hosted by me, Logan East. The Inglenook is available on all podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and others. If you like this episode, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review. It helps out a lot. Until next time, have a good one.